Welcome to the Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Mark Clements, in-depth, relevant biblical teachings will help you in life and living in today's world. Now, let's join Pastor Clements in the service already in progress. Joshua chapter 1, if you weren't here on Sunday morning, we took up this, this uh, chapter uh, we wrote down uh, just some things from the second verse. The first verse we looked at, and, and it tied into our previous battle in the Bible. Uh, and those of you here, those of you streaming, those of you listening, we're in a series right now, every Sunday and every Wednesday, till we exhaust the subject or the Lord returns. We're going to continue this series at His direction called Battles in the Bible and the Lessons, each of them contain for us that will help your life and, and, and that you can apply and are relevant uh, and are applicable and are livable. Uh, and, and, and we're looking primarily and specifically, uh, I've got notes all the way through this first chapter, but we already got to two verses on Sunday. <laughs> Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And the first verse actually tied in with our previous uh, out of Deuteronomy chapter 20, instructions. And it wasn't really a Bible, so we just kind of passed by and skirted along the edge of Deuteronomy 20, and, and we looked at instructions on when you go to battle. Now, I, I can't overemphasize it because it's in the Bible. How could I ever overemphasize anything that's in the Bible? Amen. I've been accused of overemphasizing God's grace. How can you do that when you're not saved without it? I've been, over, I've been accused of overemphasizing faith. How do you overemphasize something that the Bible says the just shall live by, that we overcome the world by, that we stand by, that we walk by faith and not by sight, that you can't please God without? It's impossible to please him. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. That the Bible itself is called the word of faith. How, how, how can you overemphasize something? So you can't overemphasize heaven. I don't think you can overemphasize hell. You want to avoid hell and you want to make heaven, praise God. But that's not the goal of the Christian life. The goal of the Christian life is not to make heaven. That's never been the goal of the Bible. Never. And yet that's been made the goal in our lifetime. We're told, come and ask Jesus in your heart and everything will be okay. You don't read that in the Bible. What you read in the Bible is come and follow me, leave everything, sell everything you have, give to the poor, come be one of my disciples, come be a follower of mine. It ought to impact every aspect of your entire life, your family, everything about you is impacted by your walk with God. See, God didn't come down in the cool of the day to be introduced to Adam, he came down to walk with him. And at the end of the book, he wasn't knocking on the door and saying, I want to be introduced to you. He already knew them, and he was on the outside because they thought they had their lives all together without a personal, living, loving, walking, talking relationship with him. No, he stood up and he said, he said, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, that means they're so involved with everything else about their life and so distracted by what's going on in their house that they don't even hear he's outside knocking at the door. If any man hears my voice, if any man hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and I will walk with him. I'll sup with him. I'll have sweet communion and intimacy and fellowship with him and him with me. See, his will goes far beyond just being introduced to us. All right, let's get back to Deuteronomy chapter 20. What was the theme of Deuteronomy 20 and the instructions on when you go to the Bible? What, 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 what were they? Understand rank. Hear from the priest before you go to battle. There are a lot of Christians that they, they don't have a representative of God in their life and they try to go to battle without it. When the Bible couldn't be any more clear that there were five levels of rank. And it said you must follow these before you go to battle. Now when we read Joshua chapter 1, what's the first thing we read? Now after the death of Moses, servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, or Nun, however you pronounce that, Moses' minister. Now, we can see rank right there again. Joshua did not start off as Moses' servant. That's what the word minister means. 
It, it maintains that meaning even to the New Testament. It's the Greek word diakonos. We, we transliterate that word into an English word called deacon. Diakonos, we get the word deacon from that. It, it literally is translated minister or servant. Joshua was Moses' servant. When Moses left the scene, Joshua stepped right into his place by the calling of God. But he was Moses' servant for 40 years before he did that. When Moses stepped uh, into eternity, Joshua was told, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. And that's what he said down here, just a couple of verses. Now, verse 2, he continues speaking to Joshua about his leader, and he puts it very bluntly and very plainly. Moses is dead. He's not going to lead you anymore. I'm going to lead you. And again, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. Now, therefore, arise, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land which I give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread, and we'll, we'll get to that maybe tonight, <laughs> doubtful. All right, but let's go back to verse 2. What was the Jordan River? What was the Jordan at this point? What was, was it sustainment to them? Was it a source of ease in travel? No. We can make boats. We can make rafts. We can, we can jet ski. You know, we, we can, we can one-footed, barefoot water. You know, what was the Jordan River? Was it a source of recreation for them? Hey, we can go fishing. No more manna. Huh? Was it a source of hydration to them? We can drink out of it. We, we're in the desert. We don't have any. They had a rock. They didn't need the Jordan River. The Jordan River was not a blessing to them. The Jordan River was a barrier to them. They had come through, finally. They had come through, led by their parents, the whining, griping, grumbling, murmuring, and, 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 and the, the complaining Israelites. Uh, they'd followed them around for 40 years. Because God, our God, your God, the one who never changes, he got tired of their complaining. He got, he, he, he'd had enough. He is long-suffering, but only long. You don't know how long that ruler is. He put up with it quite a while. But finally he said, these ten times, you, you've doubted me, you've chided me, you've complained and grumbled and murmured, uh, and, and none of you will now enter the promised land, not one of you. Except for Joshua and Caleb, they're the only two who were in faith when the 12 spies came back. Not one other adult is going to make it into the promised land. Not one. Not one. I'm going to have to wait till all of you die. And, and I said on Sunday, uh, I don't take it back. I'm not apologizing for it. I have never wanted to be that person that the Lord had to get out of the way before he could move. I've never ever, I've prayed and I've talked to the Lord and I've said, please, I never want to be the person that you have to jerk out, that you have to, the Jonah, that you have to throw overboard before there can be peace. I don't want to be that person that you have to eject before, before you can move like you want to. And, and uh, they had to. Those, those adults had to. They, they, they had to wait till they all died. And so they'd wandered around in circles and round and round and around the mountain and back and forth. If you look at their journey on a map, it's like, what were they thinking? They weren't. They, the Lord left them out there on purpose. And finally, when the last one died, can't you imagine? You know, that person's like 109, you know, and they're going, Please, you know, like, I mean, we want to go in the, the best of God is right. We can see it. We can see it. But we can't go because. Just saying, you know, just, he, but that when that person finally died. The Lord took them right up to the bank of Jordan. They could see the other side, but they couldn't get there. They could see the best that God had, but they couldn't get there. The one thing that stood between them. Now, after 40 years walking in that rock-infested desert, there is nothing out there. I've been there. 
They fight over it. Are you kidding? Take it. You can have it. There's nothing there. Nothing pleasing to the eye. Nothing aesthetically pleasing. It's not beautiful. No, no big lush areas. No canyons. No mountains. It's just... <laughs> and, and, and one of our members, she's probably listening tonight, she was on that trip that we were there. And she came to me after we'd been there a week and she said, Pastor, I'm sorry, but if I had to walk around out here for 40 years, I think I'd complain too. <laughs> They didn't just complain. The Bible says they insulted God. Well, when that last person then faded uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and died, then they could go over. All right, hallelujah, pack it up. Get your backpacks, get all your stuff, get the wagons, get the carts, get the flocks and herds. We're going! And, and there's a river out of its blanks out of its banks at flood stage. Tells you that in the third chapter. Out of its banks, raging and flowing, and there was no way to get across it. They had no army corps of engineers. They had no wood. They're not going to make a bridge. They're not going to put bar. How long would it take? And here's the barrier before them. And we're going to read. We're going to read in upcoming verses we got to get through this first chapter first, but we're going to read. It took the hand of God. And he did the exact same miracle for these people, the second generation, that he did for their parents. He stopped up the Jordan River, and it stopped flowing, and it, it, it went out across those plains for miles and miles and miles in every direction. But the ground in front of them dried up. And they took rocks from one side to the other to make a monument to the miracle that God did so that even their children would come and say, what doth these rocks mean? And they could tell the story of how God delivered them. You can't get through even your final barrier, even the last barrier. See, I know the old-time preachers, they used to preach this, and they would talk about Jordan representing death. And you couldn't get across without God's help to the other side. And the other side for them meant your heavenly home. And, 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 and so he was going to usher you even through that very last barrier between you and heaven. I don't have a problem with that, except when I look at the promised land, there's still walled cities, there's still battles to fight, and there's still giants in the land. And there won't be any of those in heaven. No, the promised land doesn't represent heaven to us that you're not going to get till after you die. It represents to us what God wants you to have all the time and is right there before you. And you can trust him to help get you through the barriers into. And that's the best that he has. The best of the land, Isaiah 119 said, they that are willing and obedient shall inherit the best that the land has. And the best in that time was in the promised land on the other side of Jordan. And so they stood there looking over onto the other side, and there was a barrier between them and what God wanted them to have. What is the barrier? That's the question. What is the barrier between you and what our God wants you to have, desires you to have, longs for you to have, envisions you having? It is his heart that you possess he wants you to possess the best of the land, the best health, the best security, the best financially, the best for your relationships, the best for every aspect of your being, your best spiritually, your best mentally and emotionally, your best socially, the absolute best of everything that God has for you. He wants you to have them, and that yet there are barriers standing in your way. And He can help you, and He will help you in getting through those final barriers to that place of promise and inheritance that his heart longs for you to possess. All right, so what are some of the barriers? I gave you seven. I gave you seven barriers, uh, and I asked you to consider what kind of others are there. What kind of others? You may have written some other ones down. You may have identified some other ones. But whatever barrier it is to me, entering into and then accepting and receiving. Now, now I think of one right now that's not on this list, uh, and, that's, and that's lack of patience. 
Yeah, I want it, and I want it now. Yes, I want what God has for me, Pastor, and I want it yesterday. I, I want it so bad. I, why do I have to wait? Why? It's God's will. It's my will. We're in unity. Why do I have to wait? Well, because our Bible says in Hebrews 6 and verse 12 that it's faith and patience that cause the, in the inheritance of the promises. Faith, and so I don't see faith up there either, but, 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 but that might be a barrier. Uh, if, there's a, if there's a non-existent faith or an insufficient faith or an or a underdeveloped faith, Paul talked to the Thessalonian church about what's lacking in your faith. I want to come and help supply. That's what he said. The next time he wrote to him, he said, your faith groweth exceedingly. So apparently there was a change between the two. Okay, But, but that verse, Hebrews 6.12, says faith and perseverance. Perseverance, tenacity, endurance, persistence, patience. Uh, and, and, and your Bible says you have need of patience. You have need of patience so that after you've done the will of God, Hebrews chapter 10, you have need of patience so that after you've done the will of God, you might inherit the promises. You have need of patience. We just gave you two verses, Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10. Faith and patience. You have need of patience. I don't see that one up there. So maybe you have some other ones, but these are seven that we came up with on, on, on Sunday. Uh, right over that there. Uh, that's a bad camera angle. Let's find one that, that, that works better and gets us on here. Maybe they have to follow me, so maybe if I stand over here. There we go. All right. See? Number one, your past. Number two, keep a camera on that if you would. Number one, your past. Number two, other people's words. Number three, it's kind of got some reflection on the screen, so I can't tell what it is. Oh, the unknown. <laughs> Number four, your opposition. That means the competitors, the opposing team, the opposition, your enemy. Every battle has an enemy. Number five, your lack of experience. That, that's a barrier sometimes, your lack of experience. Number six, your lack of help. I can't do this alone. Number seven, your lack of ability. Your lack of, these can all be barriers. Now, there may be others. I'm sure there are others. We just mentioned one. We just mentioned one. I can't sit still very long. I immediately come to the conclusion, if I don't see it happen, it must not be the will of God. No, I just, I, I just need to park it yeah. and just endure. Right. See, I, I've learned that, that perseverance is a spiritual quality. The devil doesn't have it. If I can't do anything else, I'll just outlast him. All right, so let's, let, let's tonight just share quickly with you uh, some verses. Is that all right? Yeah. Let's look at some verses. All right? Let's look at some verses. Okay, uh, uh, those of you streaming, get your, I hope you have your pen out, and I hope you're right in there. <clears throat> those of you listening, your past. Your past. Your past can be a barrier. Your past can, can, can be that thing that, that slows you down, that, that holds you back. Your, your constant attention to, to what you did, uh, uh, your, your former mistakes, the sins that you're guilty of, your past life, something you're embarrassed about, that can be a barrier. I mean, I mean, our spiritual enemy, the devil, 1 Peter 5, verse 8, your enemy, the devil, your adversary, the devil, walks around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He may try to devour you by just constantly bringing to your attention, well, you did this, you did that, you know you did, you know you did. You ought, to just, you ought to just be biblical about it. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say, so? Yes. Amen. Yeah, so? Amen. So I did. You tempted me to, and, 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 and I fell for it. But since then, I've repented, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm living free from it now. Uh, the Lord doesn't remember it. Why should I? The Bible says that our God, he said, I, even I, am he that blots out your iniquity, and your sin and your iniquity, I will remember them no more. 
One of the great Bible verses found in the 43rd chapter of Isaiah, found twice in the 10th chapter of Hebrews, and, 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 and that's an exercise of God's free will. He said, I will remember them no more. He chooses to not remember them. You take them to the Lord a second time, and, and, and after you've asked forgiveness, confessed your sin, he doesn't know what you're talking about. He's already assigned it to oblivion. That's what the, 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 the Greek word means. Uh, and it's cast into the depths of the sea, and he will never dredge it up. Never. Never. So uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 says, If any man be in Christ, he's a brand new creature, brand new creation. Old things are passed away. Everything has become new. Everything has become new. Well, yeah, Pastor, but it was after I became a Christian. 1 John 1, 9 is just for you. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to, well, I'll forgive, but I won't forget. That, God doesn't know that. He's never said that, ever. He said, if you'll confess it, I'll forgive it and cleanse you of A-L-L, all unrighteousness, anything not right. And then there's this great verse in the Bible uh, that we call the prodigal son. It's actually about two sons, and it's in Luke 15, 11 through 32. And this was, a, this was a young man. He spent all of his living on harlots and gambling and drinking and riotous living. And yet the father's heart was always that he come back. The father, and the father never mentioned it. The father, never, the father didn't run down the path and say, My son, my son, you horrible outfit, you. How dare you spend our family's inheritance on, on, on what you did I'm going to remind you of what you did every day for the rest of your miserable existence just to put you through torture because it was so horrible. That's not God. That, that's the accuser of the brethren. That's the Satan. That's the Lucifer. That, that, that's, that's the serpent. No, that's not, that's not the Lord. No, that's not the Lord at all. Uh, the Lord said, uh, I delight in showing mercy. That's the Lord. The book of Micah. He delights in showing mercy. Yeah. And your Lord and my Lord, that's Psalm 103 that says he removes our iniquity as far as the east. Is, no, let me get this right. As far this way. The east is from the west. And you know how far that is? They never meet. Amen. You go north far enough, eventually you start going south. You go south far enough, eventually you start going north. But if you go east or west, you never stop going the other, start going the other direction. You go east for the end of eternity and still be going east. And if you go west, it's the same way you continue to go west. He didn't say one direction from the other. He didn't say north from south. He said as far as the east is from the west. So far has he removed the remembrance of our transgressions from us. Amen. Don't let your past plague you. Don't lie about it. You confess it when you, when you confessed it to the Lord as sin. Yeah, I did it. I'm not going to make an excuse. I'm not going to try to fig leaf it. That's what Adam and Eve did, cover up and, and blame it on somebody else. Don't blame someone else for your sins. Confess it. Yes, I did. Okay, they got to me. I, I lost my temper. Okay, you know, I spouted back. Okay, I swung on them. You know, okay, whatever. You know, whatever. No, no. You don't make excuses. Just confess your sin and then move on. I was a rebel. Move on. Move on. I cursed. Move on. I lied. Move it on. Uh, I stole. Move on. Move on. Yeah, and, and don't let it haunt you. Meditate on the Word of God and let the power of those verses deliver you from that. In Jesus' name. All right, all right. Uh, number two, number two, other people's words. Uh, this is a barrier for many people because other people said about them in, in younger in life, you'll never make anything of yourself. You're never going to be worth anything. You're worthless. You, you can't do anything right. And other people's words. See, if all you listen to is other people's words and then let your enemy just constantly bring them back to your attention and you don't listen to God's words, we shared with you on Sunday, get a, I offered to buy anybody and everybody in this entire sanctuary, everyone viewing, everyone streaming, everyone listening, to buy you a copy of that little bit mini book, In Him. It goes for tonight as well, if you don't have one. Did we start a list? Did we have enough? We had enough to give out. All right. We have any left? We have some left for tonight if you want one. That, that, that mini book, not by buying it. By buying it, it will do nothing for you. Just being honest, by buying it, it will help you not at all. By putting it in your pocket, sticking it in your purse, putting it in the inside of your Bible, it will do nothing for you. 
By opening it up and saying, oh, yeah, it looks kind of like a pretty good book, it, it won't help you. But if you'll apply the verses within that book, 100, I think he's listed over 100, and, almost 170, something like that. There's 144 verses in the Bible that tell you who you are in Christ, that you are complete in him, that as he is, so are you in this world, that in Christ you're a brand new creature, that in Christ, and on and on and on, all of what the Bible says. See, when you take those and do what that book says, and, and, and write out, every one of them, first person, what the Bible says about me. And you speak those out loud for at least 30 days straight. What other people say about you will suddenly, as the song goes, get strangely dim. Because you'll be more focused on what God says about you. That you're a child of God. That you're the beloved in Christ. That you're a member of his family. That you're more than a conqueror. That the, and, 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 and that you're seated in heavenly places at the right hand of Jesus. That he's been made unto you wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Uh, you can just be convinced, I'm blessed going in, I'm blessed going out. You can't curse whom God is blessed. I'm above and not beneath. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm like a tree planted by the rivers of living water, bearing fruit in my season. My leaf shall never wither, and everything I touch shall surely prosper. Everything. I'm the healed of the Lord, restored in my joy, as a recipient of the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Uh, and, and, and whatever the Bible says about me is right. What people say about me probably isn't. Unless they're quoting the word of God. And I'm probably at Living Word Christian Church if that's happening. Oh man, you missed an outstanding opportunity right there. And right there. See, see, I've got this one word emphasized here uh, in, in, in my answer. And, and, and see, other people's words, other people's words are, 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 are barriers to you moving into what God wants for you and has for you. But your life is not a result of what other people say about you. Your life is a result of what you say about you, based on what God says about you. Now listen to this verse. Listen to this verse. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things that he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Your Bible says in Mark eleven twenty three, you'll have what you say. It don't say well, you'll have what they say. That's right. Your life isn't limited in what other people say about you, no matter who they are. Not when you're saying what God says about you. You say what God says about you. They say you're worthless. God says you're the pearl of great price. Glory to God. God says you're of highest value in all the universe, bought and paid for by the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ. They can say you're never going to amount to anything, and he's going to say you're, you, you're blessed going in, you're blessed coming out. Uh, every, everything your hand touches will surely prosper. Everything you do is surely blessed. I will supply all of your needs according to my riches in glory by Christ Jesus, and my provision shall always be seen. I will teach your fingers how to profit, bless God, and, and, and I'll cause it to be blown in on the east wind if I have to rain it out of heaven on top of you. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I'll bless your flocks. I'll bless your herds. Your cup will run over. I'll prepare a banqueting feast in front of you. And, and, and uh, excuse me, the windows of heaven will be opened up above you, pouring out more than you have room enough to contain. Now, you, you keep that lie about you'll never make anything in life and you'll never be worth anything in life and you'll never make it in life. Make it. I've got it made. Are you kidding? Shaddai is my dad's name. More than enough. No, other people's words can be a barrier, but only if you listen to them. Amen. Only if you ponder them and meditate on them. Now, find out what God's word says about you and put it in your mouth. He said you'll have whatsoever you say, not, not what they say. All right, should we keep going or just? 
Wow, the unknown. I, I've got this great verse. Turn, you've got to see this one with me. Turn over to the book of Acts, chapter 17. Come on, turn over to Acts, chapter 17. This is such a cool verse. I mean, they're all great verses, aren't they? This is all great verses. But, but when I was meditating on this, and the Lord said, and the Lord spoke to my heart, just said, Acts 17. Ready? Listen to this. Okay, what's this barrier called? See, see, number one was your past. Number three could be called your future. Yeah, number three could be called your future, the unknown. There's just this unknown element. What's on the other side? What's going to be there? How big are the giants? What, what, what about the city? How's God going to work? What, what's he going to do? How's it going to come to pass? How long will it last? <laughs> the unknown. There's just so many unknown elements that are barriers to people from, from, from moving forward. Look at this verse. Look at this verse. Then Paul stood in the midst, verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive in all things you are too superstitious. Now, in the margin of my Bible, you know what it says? Religious. Yeah, you, you, you're just too religious. For I passed by, and I beheld your devotions, and I found an altar with this inscription on it. To the unknown God. The unknown was a barrier to these people. They had an altar, and it said, the unknown God, and it says, whom you therefore ignorantly worship. I am here to declare him unto you. You are not going to be ignorant of who God is anymore. Amen. Ignorance of the unknown makes you build little idols and little altars that say unknown right on them. I'm going to declare to you God, and then you'll know him. He is the knowable God. The knowable God can Redeem you from the unknown. You may not know the future, but you know the one that holds it. You may not know what tomorrow brings, but he already knows the end from the very beginning. There's nothing that he doesn't know, hasn't provided you for, and is preparing you for right now. Live in trust and don't let the unknown rob you. Number four, number four, the opposition. The opposition. They knew the giants were there, but they knew something else greater. God will be there. God will be there. And Romans 8.31 says, if God be for me, then, then, then who can be against me? Psalm 27, 1 and 2, that the Lord is the strength of my life. Uh, what, can, what shall I fear that men can do to me? And, and, and then as long as we're going to battle and we're going to have an opponent, well, how about Romans 8.37? That, that in all these things we're more than conquerors. Through him that loved us. Or 2 Corinthians 2.14 that says he always causes me to triumph. I don't know how to lose because 1 Corinthians 15.57 says he always gives me the victory. And then Isaiah 54.17 says that no weapon formed against me can possibly ever prosper. Can possibly ever prosper. I see some of you and your pens are writing and you're, I, I, I watch it runs out of ink and you go like this and, and, and I hope that's happening out there. Uh, and, 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 and then some of you must have a whole lot better memories because I don't see you taking any notes. Number five, number five, your, your, your lack of experience. Remember we mentioned this one? Remember we mentioned this, Joshua chapter one? <clears throat> your lack of experience. Everybody lacks experience. Until they do it once. And then you don't lack experience anymore. Uh, uh, Joshua chapter 3 and verse 4. And, and this is where God said to them, uh, and there shall be a space between you. And he's talking about who will go first and who will go next. God's a God of immaculate order. Order in the marriage. Order in the house, in the home. Order in the family. Order in the church. Order in society. Order at the business level. There's order in everything of God. He said, let all things be done decently and in order. And here he gives the order of how they'll walk and even the space between them. And then the last thing he says is, for you have not passed this way before. You have not. I mean, that, that, that's like one of my life's verses. I've never done this before, uh, but that's okay. Uh, when I get to the other side, God will be there. And when I'm passing through the middle, God will be there. And when I take my first step toward the water, God will be there. 
doesn't matter if I've never done it before. If the Lord said do it, if the Lord said he'd be there when I get there, I don't know how many times, me personally, I don't, I don't like talking about me, but I just know me better than anybody else I know. And I know all the things that God has ever told me. I've never had the, I, I, I've never felt like I could do any of them. They were all things. I've never done anything like that before. All of them. Oh, I, I, and, and I still keep answering the same way today. Uh, uh, if you'll help me. Yeah, if you'll help me. See, don't let lack of experience, don't let that be the barrier before you. Once you do it, you'll have experience. Once you'll, that's just fear. Yep, praise God. Jump in. Yeah, amen. All right, all right, number, number, what number are we on? Number six. Number six, number five was your lack of experience. Number six is your lack of help. And number seven is your lack of ability. All right, your lack of help. Uh, John 16, 32, Jesus said, all of you will leave me, and I'm going to be alone. That's what lack of help usually means. I can't get anybody to help me, and pastor, I'm all by myself. I'm all by myself in this endeavor. If, uh, uh, I'm all by myself with these kids. I'm all by myself. I'm the only member of my family. I'm the only member at my school. I'm the only member of our team. I'm the only person at my job. I'm the, I'm the only one. I don't have anybody to help me. Um, are you a Christian? <laughs> what about the helper? Well, I mean somebody real. Oh, he's very real. Well, I mean like a real living person. He is a real living person. The Holy Spirit is not like Casper. You know, the friendly ghost. Poof, and he's here, and then poof, and he's gone. He lives right inside of you. In him we live and move and have our being. There's nowhere we are that the Holy Spirit isn't. He's everywhere. Doesn't manifest himself all the time, but if more people would give the word of God out, he would because he confirms. He's the one that confirms the word with signs following. No, Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20, I, I'll be with you always. You, you can't be by yourself. I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. Hebrews chapter 13, 5 and 6. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. John, he, he said, I'm never alone. The Father's with me. You're all going to leave me, but I'm not going to be alone because the Father's with me. And then one of my favorite verses, uh, 1 Chronicles 22, 15. Now, this is repeated a couple times here as David is speaking to his son Solomon. And this is what he says. Moreover, there are workmen with you in abundance. Hewers and workers of stone and timber and all manner of cunning men for every manner of work. You want to see what the next verse says? Go ahead and show the next verse, verse 16. Of gold, silver, brass, iron, there is without measure. Rise, therefore, and be doing of it. The Lord be with you. He's going to build a house of God. He's going to do something for the Lord. You can't do something for the Lord and him not send help and not send resources. And not send, not send finances, not send money, honey. He, he's going to send whatever it takes for you to get that job done. You have to be wise with it and manage it. Uh, and, and, and the people that he sends with you, you can't run all of them off and, and be crude with them and be nasty with them, be ornery with them and, 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 and not care about them. No, no, no. I, I remember, I remember uh, a, a traveling minister. This has been quite a few years ago because he hasn't been here for a long time. And, and I remember after he was here, and some of you would remember his name, uh, and, and uh, he was here and he, he ministered here. And then from here, he went to a different church. And in the middle of the week, then he called me up. And he, and, and he said, uh, can I talk to you about something? I said, sure, go ahead. What, what, what's the matter? Uh, and, and he said, well, now, I thought maybe he had a problem with, with something here. Maybe he had a problem with me. I doubted it, but maybe one of you. Um, he said, <laughs> oh, no, no. Uh, so I said, so what, what, what's the problem? What, what, what's, the, what, what's the issue? He said, well, he said, I came down to this church, and I was telling this pastor about how many people you have serving in your church, in the Ministry of Helps. I said, oh, that's a problem? He said, well, he told me that he can't get anybody to serve. I said, okay. He said, I just want to know, I just want to know 
how do you get so many people to serve so I can tell him the secret? <laughs> I said, well, let me just, let me just, I just want to get this clear. What did he say to you? He said, well, he said, I can't get anybody to help me. I said, okay. Well, what's your secret? I said, no, no, no. What did he say to you? He said he can't get anybody to help him. I said, okay. All right. Well, what's your secret? I said, just tell me one more time. What did, I did. I, I made him say it four times. What did he say to you? He said he can't get anybody to help him. I said, that's why he can't get anybody to help him. I've never said that. And at that time, I pastored about 15 years. I said, I have never, when I was all by myself, when I was running from the pulpit back to the sound booth and turning the cassette tape over by myself, I had nobody. When I was running the little hokey, the little floor sweeper thing on Monday mornings, I had nobody. I had no one to count offerings. I had no one to take them up. I had no one to do anything. Uh, and, and, and the congregation on one particular service was one, her. And I preach just like I preach tonight or any other day or any other morning or any other night. And I have said from the get-go that I have workmen with me in abundance, skilled laborers in every aspect of ministry and resources more than enough. Amen. I've never said, I can't get anybody to help me. And he, he's, you know, big faith preacher. And he's saying, <laughs> he, he said to me, I'll never forget. He said to me, are you telling me it's that simple? It's... <laughs> Are you telling me that it's just like the principles of faith? That's what I'm supposed to go tell this pastor? I said, no. Put him on the phone. I'll tell him. Yeah. And I'll tell it to him straight. and He'll get it. Yeah. No, 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 no. I think I better go talk to him. I said, yeah, I think you better. I think you very well better. Oh, I'd love to say he went and talked to him and he embraced it. I'd love to say he shouted and rejoiced. I'd love to say he's doing very well today and has a thriving church and a strong ministry of helps. You know what I really have to tell you? I tell you the truth. That church doesn't even exist. He couldn't get anybody to help him. He couldn't get anybody to serve with him. He couldn't get anybody to work in his church and support him and, and finally got burned out and, and he, he closed it down. That's not a good report. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy about it. I'm not happy that one of our brothers and one of our family members and one of our sister churches uh, ha had, to, had to just dwindle and diminish. But see, uh, that applies to every one of you in our children's ministry. It applies to every one of you in our adults, young adults' ministry. It applies to every one of you in our youth ministry. It applies to every one of you who is a department coordinator in our staff applies to every one of you who's trying to organize and orchestrate a prayer team. You can't call what is the way it is. You have to live by faith in this kingdom. And these are not just principles to memorize and shout amen over. You have to live them. That's right. That's right. You have to live that my God supplies every one of my needs. And the windows of heaven are open above me when you don't have two dimes in your pocket to rub together. You have to confess, my God is my healer, the restorer of my health, Jehovah Rapha. By Jesus' stripes I was healed. He's the one that bore my infirmities and carried my pains, even when pain is racking your body and you are enthroned with fever. This word has got to be more real to you than anything you see, anything you look at, anything you can taste, smell, handle, touch. The word of God is eternal, and God watches over it, but you have to be the one to give it to him to perform. You have to be. Number seven, time for us to leave. Kids are falling asleep. Some kids are wide awake, and their parents are falling asleep. Praise God. Number seven, and we're done with verse number two. Number seven, number seven, your lack of ability. Listen, there's only one who can, who can make up for your lack of ability, and he's the one who has no end to his. 
He is the only one when you lack ability, you have to be able to look to heaven and say, okay, I'm going to give you my word, uh, your word in my mouth to perform. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. By the strength of God, there is nothing you can't do. There's nothing you can't do. Now, don't tune out right away, but in one of our upcoming verses, you're going to see that God should be the one to set the borders in your life. He tells them, here's your eastern border, here's your western border. This will be your northern border, this will be your southern border, and a lot of Christians violate that. They, don't, they think they're in charge of setting their borders, and they get too big, and they grow too large, and they extend too far. Remember I said that. They get too big, they grow too large, and they extend too far, and they're outside of the borders that God has set for their life. And they can't figure out why they're not making it, why they feel overextended, and why they have a loss of strength and wear out because God never intended them to be doing what they're doing to the extent that they're doing it and they didn't get the vision from him in the first place they just said well Lord of God I can do all things through Christ see all of these rules must be adhered to or 2 Timothy chapter 2 shouldn't be in our Bible. It says, he that runs must run according to the rules that God makes. All right, so we'll come up to that verse, and you can study ahead, and you can see it, and you've already got, you've already got some, some insight into one of the other great lessons of this battle in the Bible. But, but to say, I can't do it, I don't have the ability... Uh, no, I may not have the ability, but my God can deposit it into me while I sleep at night between beats of my heart. It's called the hand of God, and you'll see it right at the very end of 1 Kings chapter 18. When Elijah, Elijah was not a track star. Some of you are, or, or some of you would like to think you <laughs> still are, you know, but, <clears throat> but, but Elijah was not a track star. And, and, and he outran the king's chariot on a 20-mile jaunt. And the king had a head start. Yeah. The king and his horses and his well-greased wheels on the fastest chariot in the land took off across the plains of Jezreel. I stood in Israel and looked out across that plain and smiled. And I thought, all I could, I could just in my mind's eye see this trail of dust. And then right by it, passed him. Outran. Why? Only one reason. Not because he had the ability, not because he'd been training, not because he was on a specialized diet. He outran the king's chariot because the hand of the Lord came upon him. That's the very thing. That's the very thing that, that Jabez, in his prayer, the third element of the prayer that Jabez prayed that God answered, that's the very thing he prayed. Oh, that the hand of God would come upon me. He said, Lord, bless me indeed. Lord, increase and expand my borders and my territories. To us, that would be my sphere of influence, my impactfulness, my effectiveness. The third thing he prayed was, oh, that the hand of the Lord would come upon me. There is not, I wouldn't say never a day, but nearly never a day that goes by that, that, that I don't ask the Lord for that, and I would encourage you to. You're, you're not wrong to. It's a Bible prayer. Oh, that the hand of God would come upon me. I can't pastor without, without the hand of God upon me. See, if I get to thinking that I can mother, or I can father, or I can wife, or I can husband, or I can work on my job, or I can witness, or, or, or I can be a faithful friend, I can, if I get to thinking I can do that on my own, see, the Lord will just stand back, let me try, and then I labor, and then I sometimes succeed, and sometimes falter, and sometimes fail. Or I can just say, Lord, there's nothing I can do worthwhile in life. Not a thing I can do without your help. Oh, Lord, let your hand be upon me today. Let your hand be upon my life as I... Then you just fill the blank in. You just fill the blank in. Help me. Help me, Lord. See, your ability is not the limitation to what you can accomplish. Your ability is not the limitation to that. Because God's ability, if you learn to tap into that has no limitation, has no end. Let's stand together tonight. Thank you for watching The Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church. 
Living Word Christian Church welcomes you to join us at 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Sunday mornings at 8.15 and 10.30 and Wednesday evenings at 7. For more information on Living Word Christian Church, visit us on the web at lwcclax.com.